Now, joining us is constitutional lawyer and uh, Ron Paul's uh, chief advisor on law. He's associate deputy attorney general and uh, general counsel of the Federal Communications Commission under President Reagan. He served as a research director for Republicans on the Joint Congressional Committee on Covert Arms Sales to Iran and on the American Bar Association's Committee on Presidential Signing Statements. He's also a visiting fellow of the Constitutional Studies of the Heritage Foundation and adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Bruce Fine is the founding member of uh, Bruce Fine and Associates, a law corporation, is a principal of the public advocacy organization, the Lynchfield Group. He is an author of The Constitutional Peril, The Life and Death Struggle, for a constitutional democracy and American empire before the fall. Excellent books both. Uh, lynchfieldgroup.org. He's presently serves as senior policy advisor, again, to Ron Paul, 2012 presidential campaign and beyond. And I, I, I want to cover the waterfront with him and get into the centralization of power and the, and the testimony they had three weeks ago in Congress where liberals, uh, professors said we're going into tyranny. Uh, and conservative uh, experts said the same thing. I mean, there's no doubt. So so what type, as a historian and a top constitutional lawyer and advisor to Congress, would he call this? But before we get to that, because he did head up the FCC, I know when they opened up the First Amendment and got rid of the so-called Fairness Doctrine, they're trying to bring that back now under new names and restrict free speech everywhere. I'd like to get his take on what Camille Paglia called uh fascist and ultra stalinistic the duck dynasty situation as a first amendment expert uh, mr fine uh, just briefly on this subject what do you make of the moves with sopa and cispa and fairness doctrines being promoted again and everything when you're one of the guys who never gets really the credit i know in being instrumental in uh, getting first amendment back into the media well, you know we forget for a while we didn't have it in this country where it is right now and what the goals are well, the restrictions uh, largely remain for only over-the-air broadcasting. It doesn't apply. All these FCC rules uh, that threaten licenses for you know, incorrect speech don't apply to cable casters or people using the Internet or otherwise. It's sort of a vestige of old-time uh, thinking and the idea that government uh, was paternalistic and knew the most enlightened way in which issues should be debated, so they would evaluate the fairness with which a particular radio or television broadcaster covered a controversial issue. I was the spearhead of uh, forcing the abandonment of, of that process. You can't believe how subjective you know, the standard was for determining whether it's fairness. You, know, you counted up the seconds or the half second of devotion to one viewpoint or another. Was it said with Churchillian eloquence or with you know, the clumsiness of a school child who weighed more than the other? It was so arbitrary, it's ridiculous. And of course, um, since the abandonment of the uh, fairness doctrine, I think the, the conversation has been much more robust uh, and fear of the intimidating effects of complaints that the FCC about fairness have lapsed. Now they're trying to bring it back in. And anytime someone goes on the airwaves, says something that other people disagree with. I mean, we ought to applaud that. That's what this country is about. If you're not big enough to be able to accept an idea that, you're dis that you disagree with, you really don't belong here. But that's really what liberty and freedom is about. Do you agree forward. as a constitutional lawyer that it's Stalinistic uh, to demand that uh, Phil Robertson be, quote, re-educated as Glad did? That it sounds like the Chinese re-education camps if you didn't echo Mao Zedong's ideas properly. Uh, the fact is people have a right to dispute what uh, he said. Uh, and uh, urge him to change his view. He's got a right to insist that he'll listen to them, but he ultimately gets to believe what he wants to believe. That's what freedom is about. And it was on Louis Brandeis said that the remedy for what somebody thinks is ill-conceived speech is more speech, you know, not coercion, not intimidation. I mean, I actually uh, had written a letter not long ago uh, in response to a former FCC chairman's insistence that the federal communications uh, should prohibit broadcasters from mentioning the word Redskins and talking about the Washington Redskins football team. Wow. I said, oh, really? You know, that, and he said, well, that would show what a great country we were. I said, no, that's not what show a great country we were. It's so that we're hostile to the idea of free minds and people being able to chart their own destiny. And moreover, no one really believes something if you have to cram it down their throat. It's just the press, you know, a, a, a recitation of what somebody insists that you say. So it really is futile in any event. But the, the fact is, um, uh, if people disagree, uh, then they should use the communications channels, the Internet, and all the other countless outlets to express their disagreement. 
Sure, that's absolutely. Well, well, I think this is back for it. And we're going to go to break in a moment and come back with the big central issue of why you agreed to come on during the holidays and Christmas coming up. We really appreciate it, Mr. Fine. But when I just start realizing all the monumental things you've been involved in for Liberty, all the times I probably had you on 15 times over the years in the last decade, I never made the point that uh, that you're the guy that helped spearhead the end of the fairness doctrine that didn't allow talk radio as it exists today. That is such a monumental example uh, of what really uh, one person can do then working with others. So I just want to thank you. I, I mean, I guess I owe much of my First Amendment and my profession uh, to you uh, helping uh, fight that. And I should have you on sometime just to tell that whole story because, I mean, a whole book should be written just on that subject. I appreciate the sentiment. Uh, we're going to break, but in one minute, how did that all come about, just, just briefly? The Fairness Doctrine was repealed through a rulemaking that we initiated. It was imposed not by statute, but by a rule in which had been improperly, uh, in my judgment, interpreted by prior general counsel at the commission as required by Congress. I looked at it, examined the background, and said, no, the Fairness Doctrine was a result of a rule we can initiate a revocation of the rule, which we did, uh, it sustained the act in the courts. Uh, and the large reason why we repealed it is because we thought it was an unconstitutional encroachment on the right of broadcaster free speech. And it, in fact, had the chilling effect of reducing the broadcasting terrain to pablum and vanilla because no one wanted to say anything controversial because then they get slapped with some kind of fairness. And that like proves that. that you were right because look at how it saved AM radio for 20 plus years, you doing that. Incredible. When we come back, speaking of rulemaking, rule by decree, Obama and this power grab, how do you as a top constitutional lawyer define it? What is the system we're now under with constitutional lawyer Bruce Fine? Stay with us. The facts are in. The studies are legion. Sodium fluoride and other members of the fluorine family that are added to Western water supplies are devastating the health and cognitive ability of the people that drink it. So the question is, why are the social engineers adding it to the water? Simple, dumb down the host population that the parasitic technocracy is feeding on. We developed the fluoride shield to be the highest quality, highest standards because I use it every day and my family uses it every single day. Let's take a closer look at the ingredients that make up this special proprietary formula. Tamarind has been celebrated for its ability to immobilize toxic fluoride residues, while zeolites have a long history of attracting and holding toxic compounds. Interfulvic acid, an excellent cleansing agent. Then we added the highest quality shilaji, a rare compound that is collected from the high mountains of the Himalayas. We topped it all off with the powerhouse herb cilantro, that is intended to mobilize fluoride and other dangerous compounds for removal from the body. And the final touch to energize this formula is our proprietary nascent iodine. And as always, consult your physician as well because that is important. And finally, Fluoride Shield, Survival Shield, and all the products at InfoWarsLife.com grew out of my quest to try to find the very best compounds from God's cornucopia to protect myself and my family. And from our research, I believe we are bringing you the best, highest quality products. And you have that commitment from Alex Jones and the entire InfoWars crew. Okay, so Bruce, you know, we called you up to get you on about a con con as a solution, or is it a bad idea to get your take on it? You said, I'll talk about that. We'll do that in the next segment briefly. But I want to talk about the centralization of power and and the best way to describe it to the public, and we talked about the hearings they had a few weeks ago in Congress where this is being admitted. And so basically, when do we become a dictatorship and what type of dictatorship it is? Uh, is it when it's institutional and bureaucratic? Uh, what do you call that, an oligarchy? Well, I call it one branch government uh, that uh, is indistinguishable from the tyranny that provoked the American Revolution. And let me to enumerate the most egregious usurpations of power. And let me just add in the side, uh, the problem is not that we need a Constitution Convention to change the Constitution. We need uh, politicians and the people to insist on following the Constitution uh, instead of flouting it regularly. 
But in any event, perhaps the most uh, awesome power that the president exercises, and this is probably in the history of the world, is the ability to kill anybody on the planet who he in secret determines is an imminent, whatever imminent could be in the next 10 years, an imminent danger to the national security of the United States. And the president has done this with regard to four U.S. citizens so far that we know of. There may be more, hundreds of foreigners. Uh, he is not accountable for any error. Uh, that is, neither Congress nor the courts nor anyone gets to know whether or not who was killed was innocent, uh, indistinguishable from what we would ordinarily call first-degree murder. For example, about a year ago, a 68-year-old grandmother in Pakistan picking vegetables with a 9-year-old granddaughter. Now, it is impossible, Alex, to conceive of a more awesome power than the authority to vanquish, to exterminate any person on the planet that you wish with no accountability to anyone. Uh, that would have made King George III blush. But that's just one example. The Constitution entrusted to Congress the exclusive power to decide on war or peace because it's fraught with so many terrible consequences. Uh, presidents routinely, and this president in Libya, he was going to go into Syria, until the American people spoke up against it. Uh, he runs warfare in Yemen and Pakistan unilaterally without any congressional authorization. I say the founding fathers believed that constant warfare was irreconcilable with liberty, which obviously it is one of the reasons why we have the Ed Snowden revelations and the, uh, what a federal judge called an Orwellian surveillance state is because we purport to be at perpetual warfare with international terrorism, whatever that means. Um, in the president's head. Uh, so we have both the usurpation of war, the usurpation over the right to decide life or death. The president has authority to detain any American citizen at Guantanamo Bay or elsewhere. No accusation or charge, just if he says you're associated with some group uh, connected with al-Qaeda. Uh, to repeat what uh, I alluded to earlier about the surveillance state, we have the National Security Agency, one, headed by someone who, without review by the president, uh, knowingly and purposely lied to Senator Ron White when he preposterously lied uh, that, uh, say, denying the NSA was collecting data on millions of Americans. Open and notorious lie. Uh, I was on the Iran-Contra committee, and there were people in the executive branch who went to prison for misstating, uh, making false representations about funding the Nicaraguan resistance or uh, armed shipments to Iran. They went to prison, and we have somebody, Mr. Clapper, who's actually promoted uh, for lying to Congress. That's so. right. In fact, Poindexter did a lot less than Clapper. Clapper ball-faced lied in the committee and got caught and has not gotten in trouble. And that sets the precedent, doesn't it, to now get away with even more? Yeah, it sort of sets the precedent. Say, these are principles, all that I've articulated. They lie around like loaded weapons, ready to be used by any occupant, any executive branch that claims any preposterous excuse. Now, we also have uh, now the idea, uh, Alex, of treaties to sort of become uh, antiquated. And where formerly we needed treaties for NATO, treaties for the Japanese Defense Treaty or South Korea, we needed treaties even to regulate migratory birds. Now the president, by executive order, which means unilaterally, uh, pledges 10, 20, 30 more years of military commitment in Afghanistan or Iraq or elsewhere. So we no longer have the treaty check on these uh, adventures abroad by the president, which end up having men and women courageous, uh, killed, die for nothing at extravagant expense, and typically end up with some kind of blowback. Uh, right now, for example, we already see that in Syria, this army, the unilateral effort to so-called arm the dissidents, uh, looks like we're end up with a jihadi state that's indistinguishable from Taliban and Afghanistan. Bruce, stay there. We've got a final segment with you. When you come back to finish up and tell us what we do about this, and and you know, tell us where this eloquent uh, breakdown is is basically ending up, and 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 how we counter it. Uh, straight ahead after this quick break with Bruce Fine, and we'll also tell you about his latest book. Stay with us. I'm Alex Jones with Infowars.com. Hello, this is Hank Hill, and I'm telling you what, you need to listen to Alex Jones. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Infoworth.com. Yeah. <clears throat> Judge, what is the secret of the universe? <laughs> Infoworth.com. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> 